It is my pleasure now to introduce Dr. Annabelle Bonn. Uh, Dr. Bonn is a hematologist oncologist um, in, in, uh, in the UK, and she's a former department head of a 650 bed hospital in Middlesex. Uh, she um, is, or, or was the uh, Dean of Postgraduate Medicine uh, at uh, Northwest Thames region. Um, and she's here today to speak to us about uh, anesthesia in uh, anesthesia and periodic paralysis. Thank you. And Annabelle, I don't know if you, you want to um, just uh, give a, a, just a brief kind of with Deb, acknowledge Deb and the, the PPI I've got would that, be great. I've got okay. that handled. Thank you so much. Thanks, Dick. I'm okay. I'm oh, on you got mic. It. Good morning. Um, following Leading Edge and Vernon's birthday, I think I'm slightly challenged actually, but uh, I'll do my best. Thank you particularly to Jake and Linda for, in, for the invitation to speak. It, it's a privilege. I should declare interests, perhaps more like shaping expectations. Please, I'm not an anaesthetist. I'm not a neurologist. Um, but I, I was a consultant physician, now retired. Uh, my other qualification for today, I guess, is, uh, is because I have Anderson to Will syndrome. Uh, with what my doctors, including the wonderful Frank Faber, very sensibly call hypokalemic periodic paralysis. But uh, I think my, my muscles are mostly hypo. Alternate Wednesdays, they're hyper. Uh, my cardiac cells do what they feel like. Um, they could be normo, hypo, or whatever. But um, I never am far from the trusty effervescent potassium, like most of us in here. Um, the delegates, all of us this weekend, um, were very mostly patients and, and our families and friends. Um, so I want in this session to emphasize the pragmatic things, the practical things that we as patients and also our loved ones, our, our carers, um, I, I don't like the word carers, but, but I know it's a wonderful word, if you know what I mean, um, that we can possibly do to emphasize events around hospital admissions including perioperative care, um, surgery itself. The choice of specific anaesthetic drugs for us is, um, is complex and is very specialized. So I'm going to take very little time talking about the drugs, but our paper, which is published at Periodic Paralysis International, um, the other charity in brackets, at hkpp.org has plenty of detail, including case reports, for example. Um, it's uh, downloadable from the, ha from the home page of hkpp.org. Um, I would like to thank um, Dr. Weber from the point of view of being his patient. Uh, he very kindly agreed to me and listened to me and confirmed my diagnosis and has, has given me so much advice since then. Um, I'd also like to just thank Pierre Lambialzi, a professor of cardiology in London. If any of you with Anderson to Will or other cardiac genetic arrhythmias are looking for a cardiologist, I recommend him profoundly uh, for specialist and pragmatic advice. I would also very much like to honor our second author, but not second in, in principle, uh, Deb cavell Grayon, uh, whose decades of contribution to individual patients, those of us, and, and to periodic paralysis and management in general is immense, and whose advice and friendship with me has made my PP life much more tolerable. I asked her originally if she'd like me to write something for the website, because uh, she's president of PPI, uh, if it would help anyone, and she suggested some notes on um, anaesthetic care, and that's the paper that results. Um, the final very important um, acknowledgement, okay, I never have much luck with these, it's not, it's not listening to me again. Paralyzed. <laughs> Give it some potassium. Oh, there we go. Did I do Sorry, something? So the, the same as you did. It's just random, no. okay. Um, <laughs> the um, main acknowledgement is to you because those of us with these disorders, these very rare disorders, if we don't share our experience on assorted websites or meetings like this, nothing really moves forward. And as, and as Steve Cannon said, I mean, you know, we never knew that somebody also had such and such, and that took us to a linkage for something. So it's acknowledging everyone 
And the final thing is that I would like you, given the tour de force yesterday from Gabe, to please consider yourselves extremely lucky that I don't own a ukulele. <laughs> so um, there are limits to what one can make people undergo. Sorry, I'm just sorting. Okay, let's see if we... <laughs> this really is deeply random. Can I press on the slide instead? Yeah. yeah. Like Can I just... The, uh, like the down button. Yeah, that works as well. Yeah. You know those four uh, that you like... Uh, hold on. Uh, I'm going to... Uh, we're going to use the... Yeah, here we go. Right yeah. here. If you go down... That one there. Is that, is that yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's All good. Right. Thanks, Jake. Sure. Okay. Sorry, all these technical things. Why did we want to write the paper? Um, very straightforward. Far too many people, personal anecdote, um, mainly streamed through PPA and through Deb cavill Grail, have had real problems with uh, anesthesia specifically, general anesthesia mostly, but also hospital admission in general, and that I can certainly personally attest to as well. Um, it doesn't have to be a specific anaesthetic, it can just be sedation, for example, for things like colonoscopy, childbirth, uh, dental surgery, <laughs> things we don't necessarily think of as surgery. But if they require um, a regional anaesthesia, for example, a regional block or a spinal anaesthesia, general anaesthesia, significant sedation with uh, propofol, etc., um, that, that they are a risk. And I would have to emphasize, um, sadly, on a cheerful sunny morning, that people with periodic paralysis have died because of these interventions, and that is well published and very well known um, anecdotally. The risk um, of the duress of inpatient stay, let alone with an anesthetic or sedation, is pri primarily um, respiratory arrest, but also cardiac arrhythmias. I would also... <laughs> I hate these things. Um, just a, a brief thing. I, I, I think it's a sort of like a 12-step program introduction. My name is Annabelle, and I'm a second-class citizen. And by that, I'm, I'm gene negative. And I'm one of the 40% of people with ATS who struggle on with bright young housemen who sort of say, ooh, you can't have proper Anderson to will because you haven't got Casey yet. You know, those of us in the room who have absolutely classic clinical phenotypes but have so far not had our gene identified, I think could be treated rather shabbily. It's like going through the back entrance at Harrods, you know, you're not really allowed at the front. <laughs> um, so I wanted to just put this up to say that these guidelines for safe care apply to all of us, um, gene negative and gene positive. And even those phrases aren't very accurate, but um, that's the start. Um, our general approach with the paper um, is to slightly muddy the definitions just to make it a more all-inclusive paper and more helpful for people. So surgery isn't just the cut with the scalpel, but it's any intervention like the ones I've just uh, mentioned. I'd also like to add cardiac catheter studies. Um, I personally have had those, and my goodness, the midazolam. I mean, I, I, I forgot my birthday for about four years after that. <laughs> so I think they can have fairly significant effects on people. Um, the risk is higher during the surgery and anaesthetic. So in the OR for Americans, uh, North Americans, uh, in theatre. Um, but inappropriate management throughout the hospital stay and I can, as I'm sure many of you can, can attest to non-surgical, elective, planned hospital stays, um, where they've really done their best to kill me, frankly. Um, I went in a perfectly well-balanced ATS person with a decent potassium level and normal cerebral function and came out the other end, the person you see today, really. I think that's probably it. Um, the evidence base is sparse. Um, in part one of our paper, we have pulled together all the case reports that are virtually findable, at least in the English language. Um, but uh, one can learn from those individual case reports in the part one of our document, which is published online, and a particular um, anaesthetist themselves will certainly learn from them because they're very detailed. Um, but basically, we've based this paper on um, sensible practice. Not to forget um, the wonderful Frank Lehman Horn and Frank Weber uh, put up this slide 
uh, five years ago, and this is so meaningful, we have to advocate for ourselves. Now, that is easier said than done, and I'll come back to that later. Uh, but we have very rare diseases. Um, physicians are <laughs> seriously often not familiar with them. Um, we should be better informed than our doctors, particularly, for example, the surgical team, who would never dream of meeting a patient with periodic paralysis. And anaesthetists, anesthesiologists, same word, are specialists for anesthesia, not for rare diseases. So a lot of this, what I'm going to say this morning is, is slightly along the lines of, whoops, self-help. Oh, no, pressing the wrong thing. Um, this is a sort of template for safe care. Um, it's, thank you so much, don't worry, I'm just making a mess, but I'm fine. <laughs> Um, communication, communication, communication. I mean, all, all slides at all conferences have one of those, don't they? Uh, I have no Venn diagrams, you'll be pleased to hear. Um, but if the, for example, let's take a surgical team admitting you for knee hole surgery on your knee, for example, uh, keyhole surgery on your knee. Actually, all the other way around, I should. Um, if they could listen to you and read your file, Good gracious, uh, how many of you have had problems with the fact you have decent paperwork describing what condition you have and how it should be managed, you give it to someone and they don't read it? Oh, okie dokie, that's a fair selection, isn't it? Um, I, I don't know how we break into that, but it's a real issue. So if you're going in for a planned procedure, the responsibilities need to be defined in detail. Um, and the sort of vague chaos of input from a variety of people needs to come out into a written individual care plan. Um, we had one up on the, um, a template up on the HKPP site, but I've withdrawn it, I, I wrote it, and we're going to put another one up after feedback from you today, for example. Uh, very straightforward, and I'll come back to that later. So if you do that, it'll probably avoid this. which I think many of us have been through. Um, yes, I did mention that a few minutes ago. Um, there, is, there are sort of stages of ensuring safe care for a hospital admission in general, let alone for the specific surgery itself. And those are the very sort of obvious stages pre on admission, because there's quite a lot that first day, isn't there? During in theatre itself, Anesthetic drug choice, which I've already mentioned, I'll talk about very minimally because that is an expert area and um, not for today. And post-procedure care. Um, starting with pre-admission, I think it's basically for up to us as patients to try and get the best information out there to this new team of doctors who are doing something else with you in hospital, um, really sort of as soon as reasonable. I know it's easier said than done, but if your main periodic paralysis physician, or perhaps your general practitioner, if that's your main doctor, can write a really good letter about how you should be managed in hospital to keep you safe, take with you all the stuff you have. And a caveat here is that um, I live in France, and it's extremely easy to get copies of all my medical records and results. But I realize that's very different in other countries. So if you want to get copies of, for example, your previous emergency reports or your lab potassiums or, or your chest x-ray results from another doctor, you may need to apply several weeks in advance. But if we can all be responsible for keeping our own dossier at home as the main dossier, um, it, it's probably safest for us. And a, a caveat that's important about anaesthesia is that some people have had real problems with a general anaesthetic and a, a big surgical procedure with a major provocation of a major paralytic event, and that's the first event they've had, and on that event they were diagnosed with periodic paralysis. So some people with spontaneous mutations, so there's no family history, no hint they've got it, have been exposed by surgery and general anesthesia, but equally if you're a blood relative of someone with a known periodic paralysis disorder, um, tell the new doctor early because, of course, you might have it. You haven't been tested yet or you're asymptomatic and um, it's just something they, they very much need to watch out for. This is hoping what doctors might do with us. The first discussion is really, is this necessary? 
and certainly I've been assessed personally for two surgical procedures where the, the risks of anaesthetic and um, long admission really do outweigh the benefits I personally would be likely to get. For example, one very trivial one, I have a, a completely unrelated artery pressing on a nerve just inside my ear. It's symptomatic. It can be operated on. And the neurosurgeon took one look at my notes and said, no, can you live with this? And the answer is yes, you can live with it. But that's a discussion I think we need to have um, about every possible suggestion. We all know gung-ho, particularly orthopods, you know, a bit of backache, right, laminectomy. Oh, off we go, we'll replace this. And uh, there's a discussion we need to have with the doctors right at the beginning is, you know, anaesthesia and hospital admission is risky for us. Can we avoid it with something else? Um, main risks are with general anaesthesia, so regional stuff to be looked at. And this is key. Um, there's absolutely classic thing of, you know, well, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get you to theatre and we'll just see which anaesthetist is on duty. Um, oh, I think it's a locum. Oh, he hasn't turned up. Um, this is not a good idea with us. It's really not. Um, the anaesthetist should be named early. Um, this is something we've recommended in the paper um, in a hospital setting, even if it's pretty trivial. Um, because, for example, um, dentist's offices, uh, your family doctor premises, a very small sort of outpatient facility with blood tests is really not a safe place. And in France, and maybe elsewhere in, in Europe, many specialists have their state and private practice in blocks of flats, literally. So you walk up past lovely sort of lunch smells, and there's your cardiologist sitting in, a, in an apartment. Um, we shouldn't be doing things to us in places like that. Um, ideally, never on a daycare basis, too. The individual care plan um, is key, and we'll, I'll come back to that briefly later. Um, a few things we wanted to flag up, but it's not just affecting hospital admission, is that I think some of us, I certainly do, have a detailed understanding of our personal safe and ideal potassium levels. Who, who here knows pretty well where their potassium should be for them to feel pretty... Yeah, that's, that's enough people. Um, if not, one always heads for the laboratory normal range. That can't do any harm, mostly in anyone. But some of us really do know that at a certain level, they're okay. And at that level, they're really okay. And the doctors admitting you need to know that. The really useful discussion yesterday about triggers. Um, I'm sorry, I'm one of the, I think, bunch of people here today who's asked for the fluorescent lighting to come off. Um, and I'm sorry, because it's all a bit in the dark. Uh, but we need to be protected from our triggers actually in, in, in hospital. And that, oh boy, is easier said than done, as I know well. It'd be nice if the admitting doctor for your new procedure understands a little bit about your life, but, you know, they're pushed. So maybe they won't. When you actually arrive, probably not even Gabe try a half marathon the week before. Uh, I don't know, would you like to do that? Perhaps you would. Um, and we've just recommended just don't, I mean, it's, it's self-evident, but maybe we need to remind ourselves sometimes, just don't exceed your normal exercise regime in the week before. You could um, print out or, or put on your tablet our, our published paper and just see if anyone in the ward's interested in it. Um, that's been moderately successful. Um, one thing is that I think many of us can and should manage our own routine drugs while in hospital. Literally, our bags, our bottles, our tubes. Um, for many procedures, we will be well enough, compost mentis enough, we can have a carer, some of the family helping us. And what tends to happen, as I'm sure you know, you give, a nurse asks your drugs, you give all your worldly drugs that you spent, you know, 11 years perfecting the timings, the manufacturers, the way you take it, whether that goes with orange juice or grapefruit juice, etc. And then you never see them again. Um, the most junior doctor on the ward re-prescribes all of them, but not all of them because he's never heard of half of them and can't spell the other half. 
Um, they then come up two days late because pharmacies have in, uh, enormously overloaded. And um, good luck to you if you get the right drugs at the right time. So I'm a huge advocate of all of us hanging on to our home drugs for dear life until they insist um, that you can't actually have one or other of them. Um, that's a pet bugbear of mine, is you go in for something completely different and a, usually a very bright research registrar in general medicine says, ooh, you've got a periodic paralysis. Ooh, I'm really interested in that. Let me look at your drugs now. Why don't we change this and why don't we change that and why don't we change the other? So if we can persuade doctors not to change our routine medication when we arrive for a knee replacement, it would be good, actually. Um, Um, the advice we give in the, in the paper is, is uh, uh, for a critical care, sort of um, high dependency, short of ITU, but, but important intensive nursing uh, care, uh, purely preventatively, um, not because things go wrong, because they often go right, um, but just because you can have the additional um, uh, sophisticated, uh, for example, respiratory monitoring and easy access to physiotherapy. We've given detailed advice on the sort of pre-op medicine, uh, sorry, excuse me, pre-op assessment for patients, uh, and including an ECG, and a pre-op or pre-admission that will involve bed rest, physiotherapy assessment, um, is, is very important. So ensuring safe care for us during admission, I think it's, it's probably this list, but we'll have plenty of time for questions. Managing potassium and glucose, managing f appropriate food and drink to around that time. Uh, for most of us, keeping warm. I know there are um, exceptional people with periodic paralysis who, who are not good when they're too warm, but I think most of us are better um, warmer. Would that be right? How many people are, are better warmer? Oh, wow, yes, that's overwhelming, yes. But the, the, I do, I'm aware there are exceptions. Appropriate muscular exercise and promoting rest and and managing stress. So managing the food and drink, hopefully that's all in the individual care plan. Um, Jan Megalo, who's one of the co-authors, um, wanted very carefully the point coming across that if you're hyper or hyper, um, you know, a classic, for example, diabetic diet is not good enough. It needs to be more sophisticated than that. Um, so she you know, particularly felt very strongly that um, the thing, I mean, how, how many of you are aware that your, your, your every day is deeply planned about when and what you eat? Yeah, that's, that's a fair number, isn't it, again? So if we can record it in the, in the care plan. <coughs> Senior nurse to be responsible for this on the ward, um, just because it's a big responsibility and, 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 and we just thought the domestic staff, it's not a fair responsibility for them um, at that level of, of seniority. I just thought I'd pass on my favourite experiences of food and drink management for me in the French system. Uh, one of your bloody electrolyte tests is too low. And that's, that's all they tell you. And I thought, yes, you know, <laughs> it's likely to be. I've got <coughs> hypokalemic periodic paralysis with a few frills around the edge. So your doctor wants to, you to eat all of these today. <laughs> and, and in came the bunch. So <laughs> and I think if I'd taken in that much carbs, I think I probably wouldn't be here this morning trying to, trying to present this to you. My second favorite one that happened to me, you were an unexpected admission. We will probably all know this. That, that, why is there always somebody really strange in the bed before us? <laughs> you get the menu card that carries over that they've ordered, and you think, how could anybody order that for supper? You know, this is getting silly. And so your dessert this evening is the one ordered by the previous occupant of this bed. <laughs> and, you know, that's... Uh, I don't know about it is for lots of you. That's, that's not ideal for me for supper, you actually. You eat it, though. That's the year in the hospital. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and the French food always looks nicer, but it tastes just the same. Um, appropriate muscular exercise. Um, 
that's up to you to make your own decision about. But I think a strong thing is don't let them keep you in bed for no good reason. Um, I think there's a control thing. You know, you need to stay in bed in case the physiotherapist comes. You need to stay in bed in case the consultant's doing an early ward round that day. And you end up with periodic paralysis, um, bed bound and in trouble. So I, I think it's um, up to us to trot around. It's deeply unpopular in hospitals. I know that well as a doctor and a patient. But we should be responsible for trotting around and keeping ourselves um, fairly active. And the next one on the admission thing is this would be a typical day in a large teaching hospital. Um, you need to go to the blood de department, which is in the, uh, the Fleming Wing 11th floor east. Uh, sign the paperwork to use, etc. So I just from experience, but I'm sure it's self-explanatory, but maybe on your own personal checklist, flag up very early the need for a wheelchair particularly if you walk in as a walking case, um, if they then want to send you over to x-ray, over to blood test, over to admin, whatever, I, I personally can't do that walking. And if you flag up sort of late in the day that you need a wheelchair to take you all the way around, I, my experience is they're not always available. For British viewers of Holby City and casualty, you'll notice, you know, porter please, and there's one point eight seconds later with a brand spanking new wheelchair, but that, that doesn't really work in practice, does it? Um, promoting rest. I think managing stress, we've, we've all had quite some experience of this, so I would have nothing to add to your personal histories about how to manage stress of having a rare disease that is frequently misdiagnosed, mistreated, and all round um, buggered up, if you'll excuse the expression. I think some of us may have been through that scenario occasionally. Um, in managing stress, ad adrenaline per se of the stress is, is physiologically extremely <coughs> active and extremely not helpful with any of the periodic paralysis disorders. Um, there are issues you need to discuss with your specialist or you'd have your own views about it having done the research. Um, how much do you want pain to be controlled, anxiety to be controlled, sedation, etc. Uh, but I think some of us know well that most of those groups of drugs can actually provoke um, paralysis. In theatre, um, the OR, operating room, um, the main problems there are again the physiological ones, uh, which is up to you and the doctors, mostly the doctors. Uh, managing ventilation in many patients who've got respiratory dysfunction and it's been very useful talking more about respiratory dysfunction and uh, in passing I have a personal thing that I think far too many with periodic, people with periodic paralysis are undiagnosed sleep apneics. Um, there's an extraordinary anecdotal level of people with periodic paralysis who have been diagnosed with obstructive or central sleep apnea I personally have been diagnosed with both and I use an ASV machine routinely. Um, I think it's woefully underdiagnosed and it seems coming through the various fora and talking to Deb Grayon um, that sleep apnea uh, is very common in periodic paralysis. Why? Don't know. But people don't seem to be screening for it just yet. And the other challenge of course in um, operating theatre is it's jolly cold and if you've been in one recently. They're freezing. Aren't they? I don't know how they work in them, actually, let alone be a patient. The air con's always racked up. Um, you're nude at best. Um, but there are things that can be, that can be done to manage that. Um, a very key thing in, in all neuromuscular disorders, but uh, possibly, not quite particularly, but, but very much including periodic paralysis, is to keep the patient warm. Um, this is very important even in regional anaesthesia. It worsens myotonia, it increases sensitivity to a number of drugs, and in many of us it's actually a specific trigger. So we need to be kept seriously cosy, and there's lots of ways to do this. Um, again, I've, I've had them increase the actual room, the theatre room temperature, which isn't very popular, but it helped me a lot. All intravenous solutions can be warmed in various ways, either with an inline warmer or kept in a warm cabinet. Um, etc. Um, 
my favourite idea of a warming blanket would probably be this. <laughs> <laughs> and specifically, of course, because it's an otter. As it, yeah, near? No? No, maybe the pun doesn't work. It's a water otter, so, or a kettle, as it's known to other um, Sorry, not everybody. Um, but I was once given a proper one of these, and it was wonderful. It was seriously wonderful, and it, it was the first minor surgery I'd had without paralysing afterwards. And it's just a puffy warm air blanket, and it's, it's brilliant. Um, there are very extensive published reviews, Cochrane and NICE, National Institute of Clinical Excellence. Uh, briefly on to the anaesthetic drug choices. As I say, I won't go into this in detail. I'm not an anaesthetist. I, I don't want to confuse the matter, but there's a lot in both parts of our paper about actual individual drug choices. Um, two excellent reviews. Um, sum them up. Neither of them specifically about periodic paralysis, but about uh, mostly genetic neuromuscular disorders in general. But they're very good reviews, but a lot is in our published paper. Um, that would be that's my only slide on the drugs. Those are the, and there are other in, instructions, warnings. Um, if you have questions about the individual drugs, please ask Frank Weber, not, not me. I'm not the expert on that. But as I say, there's lots in our paper about that. Um, if you have Anderson Tawil, which some of us do in this room, the anaesthetic drug choices become significantly complicated, I think it would be fair to say, without hopefully scaring anybody. It requires very close cooperation between a senior cardiologist and a senior anaesthetist, including, we recommend, but we don't know if this has ever actually been uh, applied, having the cardiologist present in the operating theatre and recovery room for major surgery under general anaesthetic for somebody with anderson Tawil. That's our recommendation. We don't know if it's ever been used but a very specific basis, but I just wanted to put it up um, that most people know that all drugs that prolong the QT interval on the ECG are prohibited in anderson Tawil. I think most people know that, but possibly what they don't know is even if the patient has never been demonstrated to have a prolonged QT interval. So you don't have to show that you've got one to necessarily avoid all those drugs. There's one um, excellent review on drug choices and anaesthesia in Anderson Tawil, Packer and Stratling, the long list of relative or absolute drug contraindications include, and that's an accurate list, and many of them are emergency or surgery drugs, um, to which as someone who knows these drugs, as I do, and has Anderson Tawil, I have to admit that my reaction to that list was something along the lines of <laughs> I, think, I think he expresses quite nicely what I felt when I saw that list. Um, so I've sort of written in my own you know, personal medical paper, you know, laughing gas and a mallet is just fine, um, will be fine. Um, I'm sorry, I am slightly joking, I don't want to scare anybody about it, but the drug choices are complex and so we do need somebody on our side who knows what they're doing. Um, Post-procedure. Sort of usual stuff, but very important. I think, I think um, there's a sense that if you go in with a rare neuromuscular disease and you have, for example, your knee replacement or whatever, um, you come out of, of theatre and everything's fine and you're breathing and everybody's happy, you know, sort of, bye, you know, go home when you like, you know, aspirin. Uh, but actually the post-operative care is a very, very risky time, even though you're apparently doing extremely well. And the main thing is prolonged post-operative dense paralysis. And this may well not be a response to anaesthetic muscle relaxants, but actually a periodic paralysis attack. The usefulness here is to have somebody advocating for you in the family or your friends or whoever knows your attacks best because you can helpfully intervene and say, actually, this doesn't look at all like their normal attacks or this is absolutely classic. Put them on their side. Give them some potassium. I'll stay with them. I'll call, you know. Um, and your help, the, the carer's help, can be very important here. Uh, we certainly recommend frequent neuromuscular assessment post-operatively 
and continuous cardiac monitoring. Never did anybody any harm and really has helped a lot of people in this circumstance. ATS, of course, but also potassium shifts in non-ATS periodic paralysis. So the final slide before just a discussion around it, ensuring safe care post-procedure High dependency unit for preferably 24 to 48 hours preventatively. I hasten to add there's a lot of successful big surgery going on with people with periodic paralysis. Or until the patient, which would be earlier, clinically stable, normal muscular strength, stable potassium within their ideal or the lab normal range if you don't know your ideal. Um, and then our recommendation is that too much monitoring of everything that moves that might go wrong with you is never a problem. Um, too little might well uh, be regretted. So finally, what can we do to help ourselves um, keep ourselves safe? Come in with as much detail as you can from your files or from your expert physician, whoever that may be, and I know it's different for many of them. Um, get this individual care plan written with the new doctor who's doing whatever procedure it is and we'll have a new um, template for you to use and change as you wish up on the website um, within a, f a couple of weeks now ask for help and try to be strong but i would like to emphasize because i deeply believe in patient power and always have in my own practice for non-emergency situations you do have free choice and free will and this is a repeat, roughly, of a conversation that I had with a young doctor on the medical team for an unrelated issue last year. You've never before met anyone with my diagnosis. You've actually never heard of it, which he told me. And moreover, he told me he couldn't even spell it. But you refuse to prescribe my potassium, saying that the doses I'm taking are fatal and I've been taking them daily for years, and ta-da! Um, refused to prescribe it, saying, I'm not prescribing 120 milliequivalents of potassium a day. I'm simply not going to do it. He's never heard of my disorder. He then, um, this doesn't apply to me, because I don't take it, but it applied to a friend, cancelling the Diamox, because the only two indications he knew for it were uh, glaucoma and going up Mount Everest. And so the conversation was, I don't have glaucoma, and this hospital is at sea level. So the diet box was cancelled, not me, a friend. You've cancelled my special diet, because I've never been diabetic. You prescribe pre-op intensive exercise to help my weak legs. No, please don't do that for most of us, I have to say. Um, that was the conversation with the young doctor, to which my reply was, OK, young doctor, could you do three things, please? Write your opinions down. They're really interesting. Place those notes in that yellow thing over there. Call my PP physician, please, because we've got a bit of a misunderstanding going on there. And if you're not willing to do any of these, because you plead, ask, ask the ward clerk to call me a taxi. Because for an, an elective procedure, you have the choice to walk out. If you don't feel safe, um, try and negotiate getting safe, but you can walk out. So what have we achieved with our paper? We don't know, um, but we have had some individual feedback, some of it through HKPP and some through PPA, and one other forum too, surprisingly, but that didn't last very long. It was taken off, unfortunately, on that one. Um, the information has been helpful. Um, have any of you used our paper? Yes. Was it helpful? Um, yeah. yeah. Oh, well, that's, that's good. I mean, actually, most of us don't need too much elective stuff going else on in our life, but... Um, stay longer and uh, under intensive care, even if it was on my foot. So. That's good. That's great. That's good news. Yeah, thank you. Um, please email me with any comments. My email's on the paper itself about wider distribution. I've got three quick slides um, that's me being naughty because I've actually got the stage. <laughs> so you can't stop me, can you? Um, Deb Gray and I wrote um, between us a paper recently published in Neurology Advisor. Part of it was my, <coughs> excuse me, sorry, my diagnostic journey, but part of it was some things that we'd really like sorted out in periodic paralysis. So I'm just using 
um, the fact that I'm here with a microphone. We need accurate, free of charge, prescribable, easy to use, home potassium meters. Oh, please, when will some team get, this, get their act together about this? We've all had the dawns of the old LACWA and now the new LACWA. I mean, I don't know if this conceivably is slander, but the new LACWA twin, I mean, I, I wouldn't use to judge the temperature of a rice pudding, frankly. I mean, it's given me results that are completely bonkers, and it wasn't cheap either. We need this. Please, could somebody do it? And it will apply to many people with, for example, genetic renal disorders. It will apply to people with uh, chronic renal failure. So it's not just this niche group of one in a thousand, one in a million, one in a whatever. We need them. Why is there so much published emphasis on molecular channel details? We know that forwards the science, and it's wonderful. I mean, it's crucial, it's fabulous. But some of us think it's got a little bit out of balance and that there's not enough being published um, about clinical features improving diagnostic ability and treatment. It, does, it, does that ring a bell with, with anyone? I think, I think there's a sense we're just heading molecular in publications now. Crucial, extremely important, may find cure. But in the meanwhile, there's a lot to learn from us. Deb particularly wanted me to emphasize that um, current treatments are at best only adequate. We should not be grateful for the pretty decent state some of us are in some of, us of the time. We should and could be better. And if we can help our doctors work towards this, all, all the better. I mean, five years ago, I wasn't triathling. Triathling? Uh, triathlonging, <laughs> Um, like Gabe was, but I was sure as hell uh, extremely athletic and sporty like I had been most of my life. And like many of you, I'm, I'm walking stick bound and weight gain and all the huge catastrophe of not being able to exercise. This isn't good enough. This isn't acceptable treatment. We shouldn't be grateful for it. Um, permanent muscle weakness really has to be acknowledged. I think if you go into, for example, a neurology hospital, Everyone who has uh, Duchenne dystrophy or multiple sclerosis, you know, please choose a wheelchair of your choice. What can we do in your house? Is a, do you need a permanent taxi service? And then the other conversation is, you, sorry, you've got what? Per, 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 periodic, what? what? Um, it, it's just, I mean, there are some centers, uh, probably one on each continent, frankly, just one, where you'll see as somebody with a muscular disease amongst a neuromuscular patient group and you are offered the su physical support you need with permanent muscle weakness but we should not be paying for our own wheelchairs for example whichever country you're in that has state insurance this is not acceptable and um, we're still in trouble with things like that when oh when will publications stop saying that you have to have a potassium of point four before you could be paralyzed. Now, I know we have a problem with existing publications because apart from a few of them, which are like the gene reviews constantly updated, and I have got one or two of them changed by writing to the authors. Um, but new publications, um, you know, case reports, three cases in, in a Singapore case review or something, go back to the publications that says you cannot be paralyzed in hypo unless your potassium is below, even 2.5 is published. Well, you know, they can take photographs of me at 3.2. You know, I'm in real trouble, as I'm sure quite a lot of us are. I, I just wish somebody, and it goes on with yesterday's discussion about uh, diagnostic criteria. If we can get, a, you know, one of the leading units to just put out a black and white paper, um, one can be paralyzed in either hypo or hyper, with a shift within the laboratory normal range. I think a lot of us would be kept an enormous amount safer, frankly. Um, acknowledge that sleep disturbance, I've come across that. I think, I personally think, it's personal view only, based on anecdote, that all people with periodic paralysis <coughs> should be screened for sleep apnea. I think there's an issue there. Um, We've discussed very nicely, thank you very much, Steve, for the references this morning about <laughs> respiratory muscles. I I'm intrigued by it because it doesn't make sense to me. I mean, it's a voluntary muscle body, but there we go. Um, this is a key issue for many of us. How many of you have had adverse reactions to medications? Yeah, that's, that's a fair number. 
I've, I've had some absolute doozies with, with drugs, um, and I currently take a neonatal dose of a beta blocker. Literally, it's a dose for a neonate. And <laughs> I'm really not a neonate. And it took my cardiologist about a year to get my dose down to the level I could tolerate it. Uh, there's a real issue with how, presumably, because of the channelopathy, um, some of us are handling drugs and their dosage and uh, other side effects. I have a, a faint suspicion it might even be allergy, but um, I can't link that into anything as well. This is the last slide on this. Very strong anecdotal evidence, certainly through the um, Deb Grayon's um, listserv, uh, that many patients with PPD also have an ehlers danlos syndrome. This, to my knowledge, has never, ever been published. I can't find any linking paper about those two disorders. How many people here think or have been told they've got ehlers danlos however mild? I have. I've got hypermobility. And yeah, well, you know, that's... That's statistically a bit iffy for a start. That's a gorgeous paper for a research registrar somewhere in a neuromuscular unit, but it's unpublished. And also, it might be really relevant uh, with gene linkage, and also it's relevant about treatment, because, for example, the care you need with permanent muscle weakness is different if you have ehlers danlos as well. Uh, physicians, please understand that in the one published paper about it, 90% of a number over 60 respondents report muscle pain. Um, personally, I hurt. Does anybody else hurt? Oh, okay, that's the whole room, including some carers, actually, <laughs> so, <laughs> which I'm not surprised about. They hurt. Um, they don't often hurt. They don't hurt a lot, they, you know, but they hurt. And the, often analgesia is refused, or drug-seeking behavior is challenged. Um, genetic testing, this is a bugbear because I'm so-called gene negative. Um, it's pretty sparingly off offered across the continents and it takes a long time for results. And before it was available in the 1990s, good neurologists and general physicians made a clinical diagnosis and upon that they started treatment. And that's been lost because the neurologists and general physicians now um, want the reassurance, I don't know what it is, it's complex, of a genetic diagnosis. I've personally had an experience with two periodic paralysis physicians in two different countries who said, you've clearly got Anderson Tower with mainly hypo, and it wasn't Dr. Weber either, because he treated me immediately, thank you, but two others who said, but we don't have your genetic, one said, we don't have your genetic results yet, come back when they're available, about nine months, and I thought, well, hello, I'd quite like to avoid the emergency admissions I've been having the last year. And the second one said, saw me off, wouldn't see me until my genetic results were available, then said, you do not have any of the known common mutations. There is nothing wrong with you. I'm dis discharging you back to your GP. And one was a national expert in PP in one country who wanted to wait for the results, and the other was a regional expert in it in another country who literally discharged me with, there is nothing wrong with this patient. Luckily, he put it in writing, which was really helpful for me, because I was then fairly naughty as to who I sent copies of that to. Um, and I understand he now understands that gene-negative Anderson Tower exists. But he was the head of a regional clinical service in a very large country. And my last and final slide, and thank you very much for the opportunity today. <laughs> Annabelle, that was extremely insightful. Thank you so much. Doesn't everything sound better in a British accent? <laughs> so just, maybe it's just because I'm American. I don't know. Uh, so um, we have to go to lunch at 12.15. That leaves about a half hour for Mickey to talk about um, some stuff. Uh, it, it, raise your hand if there's burning questions about Dr. Vaughn. There was a hand in the back. So we, let, we can do one question because we should. That's not mine. Well, no. That? That's a very good point. So, I'm, sorry, do repeat it. Okay. I'm just wondering if increasing the temperatures in an operating room increases the risk for infection. Um, 
at the risk of answering that just as a, as a leukemia specialist, so not my area, um, in principle, yes. I mean, the hotter you get, the more bugs are at risk. I'm not aware that, uh, that does anybody know, I'm not aware that operating theatre temperature settings are based on infectious protocols. I think they're based on sort of staff comfort and staff, you know, endurance and things. Does anybody know that, the answer? I don't, I'm afraid. But I would very much doubt that changing it from example to... From I, I think they are set at the uh, low temperature because of the bacteria. I was told... <laughs> be, be, because of infection? Yes. I'm sorry, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Okay, well... But I, I don't know how well the risks are uh, known if you uh, go to a higher temperature. I think God, for, I I, for a temporary, you know, for a one-off, it's probably fine, especially yeah. if, if the patient calls for that, but that's why we have warming blankets. Yes, right. if, you can get, if you can get one. Yes, I have a question. Uh, no, more something to tell. Uh, you talked about a uh, potassium meter at home. Mm -hmm. Uh, a few years ago, I uh, contacted Stadpad Technologies, and they are almost ready to um, send it to people to try it at home, the oh, little device. I don't know if it is uh, the blood from the uh, vein or uh, like in diabetes, but did you ever heard of them? Um, I had heard through Deb Grail that yeah. things were, were going on, but I've not had any confirmation about that. Oh, I can, I have the last information, so I can... Would, would people uh, find a home, a really accurate home finger prick, perhaps, like diabetics use, blood potassium meter useful? Yeah. 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 Uh, I'd, I'd, the problem is we are a niche population, but, but then, as I mentioned, I mean, people with assorted kidney diseases, their potassium is extremely important too. I'm, I'm not quite sure why it's got stuck, because the LACFA twin, the new one, you know, the pretty purpley thing, could work, but they've deliberately blunted it um, because they didn't want the, um, so I'm told, I hope this is accurate, they didn't want the enormous amount of work involved to get FDA approval were it, it to be used on humans. This one is already FDA approved, but they uh, had to make a few changes. What, I do, can do give you, know you the information. Yeah, it would be great if you could. Yeah, okay. yeah it would be super.